Do you care about your environment? Yes. You say yes. That's wonderful. Uh, if I ask you this question a hundred or a hundred fifty years ago, what would your reaction have been? You would have looked at me with big eyes and said, what? <laughs> so, it's an illustration that our view on the environment has changed, and it has changed a lot. So I'm going to take you through human history, and well, let's exaggerate, prehistory as well, and see how our perspective, our view of the environment has changed. And I see there are sort of four periods, and I name them as you can see them here. So, we started off as hunter-gatherers a long time ago. And as a hunter-gatherer, you are part of the food web. Uh, so, yes, you do affect your environment, but we try to keep that influence as little as possible. Why? Well, if you cut a tree today, you'll have a very hard time eating its fruits next year. Now, all of this changed a lot when we developed, invented agriculture. Because then, instead of keeping the land as it was, we started to change it so it could supply us with what we needed. So we changed natural ecosystems to fields and pastures. Uh, that led to deforestation, changes in the water cycle. And then we stepped it up. During the Industrial Revolution, instead of changing the land, we started, started to take what we needed. We were mining everything, not only for coal or for minerals, but we were actually even mining forest, clear-cutting. That was developed in this time. What does it lead to? Of course, environmental destruction, pollution, water pollution, air pollution, and people talk about air pollution in, for example, Amsterdam. But that is completely uncomparable with how industrial cities looked at about 1800, 1850. So, the key or the main thought at that time was that the environment was there for us. Now, all that pollution, among other things, had some effects on how we changed our view again. So during the 20th century, uh, we got a period that I've called a period of event, environmental alarm, where people started to sound the alarm about things they see, they saw that was go were going wrong in the environment. Now, I'll take you through a few uh, issues here. Uh, an old one, in 1962, Rachel Carson, uh, published a book, it's called Silent Spring, because she said, because of our overuse of insecticides, birds are declining in numbers, and in a few years' time, there won't be any birds singing in the spring anymore. She was also very worried about the effects of insecticides on human health. She said, we need to change that. Now, what did it lead to? It led to a tremendous change in public opinion. But nowadays, and it started then, we were much more critical towards the use of insecticides and other chemicals. And it also led to a ban on DDT, which was one of the most widely used insecticides in those days. Another situation, a bit more recent, and I'm going to reveal how old I am, uh, I was your age when this was in the news. Uh, we heard about dying forests, lakes, rivers, uh, there was damage to limestone buildings and statues. Uh, but I found it very interesting, at least maybe not then, but now I really do. Because first we learned what causes this. Well, we were burning fossil fuels in our cars, in our factories, in our industries, electricity plants. And that caused all the acid, that damaged well, you, what I just said a moment ago. But it was also interesting in a sense that there was a time of solutions. People were looking for ways of doing something about it. And you see a little list over here. They removed silver from petrol. Makes it a lot better. Uh, the car catalyst was introduced. 
well, but also made it better. And then you can't use something like a car catalyst and scale it up for an electricity plant. So you have to do something else. You simply wash actually all the acids out of the gases they produce. That's called the wet scrubber. And also you can repair the damage uh, by putting lime in forests and lakes and so on. Um, all good news. But I would like to look at the other side of these developments as well, because they're not only good news. DDT was banned on most of the planet because, or, or as a result of the publication of that book, Silent Spring. But the result of the ban on DDT was that a lot more people died in malaria. And we're talking huge numbers. See, there's a number of 425,000 people who died of malaria two years ago. <coughs> uh, that's not only because of a ban on DDT, but I'm only using this number to indicate that this is a big problem. Malaria is a big problem in the world. So big that the World Health Organization actually has decided to postpone their ban. They're fighting for a ban on DDT, but they said we can't do it yet. They actually say it is in some places better to actually spray the insides of your houses, like twice a year, to kill the mosquitoes before they infect you. Now let's look at that acid rain. Um, what we saw in the news was very exaggerated. We saw pictures of complete forest dying. But when you really look at what was happening, uh, you saw that, yes, in some places, a lot of forest was dying, but that was not always because of, very often not because of the acid. In many cases, there was all the air and water pollution around the field forests. Um, there were even situations where a whole forest was dying, and that was simply because, like a hundred years before, people have been planting trees. So all the trees were the same age, and these were short-lived trees. So that's an age of about a hundred years. They were all dying of old age. But we did get it in the news. But also, far fewer lakes and rivers were affected than you got from the media. So that, then I get a question like, hey, we spend a lot of money, or we spend money on making changes, but our decision was based on exaggerations. The, new, the media blew it all out of proportion. And then I wonder, okay, is it worth the money? Now, if you look at uh, car catalysts, yes, they drove up the prices of cars. Uh, electricity probably became a little bit more expensive, but still, everyone could buy cars. We could all afford electricity. So despite the fact that it cost money, it wasn't so much. The great thing was that this is an environmental problem where we could really see the result of what we changed. You can see that the amount of acid in the environment was going down a lot. So, was it worth the money? Yes, it was. Now, what's in the news now? Global warming and climate change. So we hear about rising temperatures, rising sea levels, or dramatically rising sea levels even, more storms, more droughts, more forest fires. We also hear about solutions. We have to reduce our carbon dioxide emissions, and we can do that by changing to solar and wind energy. Okay, it's time for a reality check. And now I need an assistant, Harriet. Um, oh, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I, I'm confusing everyone, including that Harriet over there. Uh, I have another assistant, not, maybe not as charming, definitely not as tall. <clears throat> oh, oops, sorry. This is the Harriet I was talking about. Uh, just for your information, I've been measuring her. So from the toes to her mouth is 30 centimeters. Yeah, 30 centimeters. And now we're going to do a quiz. I announced it to some of you. Yes, you're fine. 
How much time does it take the sea water to rise from Harriet's feet to her mouth? Okay, multiple choice. Will this take approximately one year? Put your hands up if you think this is about a year. No one? Good. Uh, what about <coughs> 10 years? Would this take about 10 years, this sea level rise? No? Yes? I have one yes. Great. <coughs> Remind it, uh, remember that yes. Uh, would it take a hundred years? Anyone looking for that? No? Yeah, uh, a few people over there. <coughs> uh, ladies and gentlemen, I have to say that the majority of you succeeded. You passed the exam. It would take about 150 years for the water to reach her mouth. Is it a dramatic sea level rise? No. Nah, it's a matter of definition. It's a sea level rise, that's true. You sit still. <laughs> now let's look at this little list. More storms? Well, the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel, the panel on Climate Change, says that in a special report on extreme weather, we don't see any evidence of increasing number of storms. More drought? In some places in the world, yes, in others not. I have to take the United States, it's always in the news, it's very dry over there. Well, it is becoming less dry over there. So the media are sketching a picture, it isn't supported by the facts. More forest fires? Uh, sorry, not true. At least, maybe in some places in the world. But take the US again. We saw all the big forest fires over there in the news. Forest fires in the United States are decreasing in number and the area affected is decreasing as well. What we do see is that some forest fires become really, really big and very intense. Is that the result of global warming? No, that's the effect of poor management of those forests. There's too much flammable material, so if it catches fire, you get a huge fire, and a very intense and hot fire. Now let's look at carbon dioxide emissions. It's very expensive to reduce them. The Dutch government is presenting a lot of measures, but if you look at some of the calculations of what it was going to cost us in the long run, and don't believe what they told you yesterday, because what came out yesterday is not going to be very expensive, but I don't think it will do anything, or at least very, very little. It will never ever make us reduce our carbon dioxide emissions by 49% in 2030. It's not going to happen. Uh, but it's very costly. Because I've done a little calculation. I've looked at the estimates of what it would take to make all these changes, and I've divided it by the population of the Netherlands. And then it will cost me about 1,000 to 1,500 euros per year. From now till 2050. Now, the moment at home, two kids, two parents, so I'm supporting about one child. So for myself, I have to think, okay, 1,000 to 1,500 euros times two for my son, for example, that would be between two and 3,000 euros a month. A, a year, sorry. Oops. But that is about a monthly salary. Can I lose a full month's salary every year? The answer is very simple. No. Then solar and wind energy. Oh, they're beautiful. Uh, but they won't do. And it will have, very, have hardly any effect on our CO2 emissions. They won't do. Well, there are two problems with solar energy. And they're on the next slide. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, the lights went out. And it happens more often, actually. It happens once a day, we call that night. And it happens once a year, but then for a longer period of time, and we call that winter. So what we need to do, it is actually text there, but I put black on black. 
uh, we need to store electric energy. This is the only way to, uh, to survive the night. Or to store wind energy, because if the wind isn't blowing, we have the same problem. But that's a technology we don't have. And then you can think, oh, that's all we have. But I assume you call brand names maybe, like Tesla or whatever, electric cars. And you miraculously come home from work with a fully charged battery. You drive home, but when you get there, the battery is fully charged. Then it powers your house throughout the night, and then in the morning, when all the miracle is happening, your battery is full, so you can actually drive to work. That's not realistic, and there are not enough of those batteries around to store the huge amount of energy that we need during a night or during a winter. <coughs> So we really have to look at, at better ways of storing electric energy. What we have so far doesn't do it yet. Now there hardly any effect of the CO2 or the CO2 emissions. I have taken a case study, Germany. Germany has invested an awful lot of money, about 500 billion euros over the past uh, decade or something, to uh, build out solar power, wind power. About 20% of that power comes from the wind. I'm not sure about solar power, it's a bit less. But it's quite a lot of energy that you can get from renewable sources. Uh, the problem is that you, they have over 20% of renewable energy sources, but that CO2 emissions have gone down with a much, much smaller percentage. And probably not even because of solar and wind power, but because of reuniting Germany, Western East, the economic crisis, and so on. And the reasons to that, but I don't have time to go into why it doesn't work so well. But it's a fact. And it comes at a price. Germany may have the highest electricity prices in the world. And the latest estimates I have seen about people in Germany who cannot afford their electricity bill, so they are without electric power, are ranging between 600,000 and 800,000 people. Let's say the population of Amsterdam. I think that's rather dramatic, isn't it? Now, of course, we think, you're so negative. Let's ask you a question. Do you care about your environment? What shall I say to that? Yes, I do. I care a lot about your environment. But I think we are in for a paradigm shift. We really have to change our way of doing things. What do we have to change? We have to change the way we act and why we act. We should not base our actions on emotions. That something feels good doesn't mean it's also good for the environment. We need to support what we do with facts, science, unbiased views on what's really happening. And what we do needs to be realistic. We need to be able to store energy, for example. We need to develop that. We also need to be able to pay the bill, because if we can't pay the bill, it's not going to happen. And what we do must also be relevant. What do I mean? If we do something for the environment, it needs to make a difference. 